Hello and welcome to the Robot Podcast. I'm Fran Scott, scientist, maker and massive engineering fan. Every week we'll be finding out how robots are pushing the boundaries and exploring the exciting future that robots can bring. From 3D printing buildings to simulated factories, from robots in education to those working in our retail warehouses, technology is completely transforming our everyday tasks and leading us towards a more innovative future. Today is the final episode of Series 2, and we're doing something a little bit different. As you know, across the series, we've explored how robots help us throughout our industries all around the world, from the classroom to the supermarket, and we've spoken to so many incredible experts. However, we haven't been able to include all of the conversations that we've had just due to time limits. So today, like a box of Christmas chocolates, we're going to be sharing with you a special selection of unheard conversations that we've had with our guests. And I'll also be discussing some of my personal highlights too. Now, I want to start by looking back at our most recent episode, which was that one that explored the retail sector and how it's been transformed by, of course, robots. I had some really fascinating conversations throughout that episode. Um, in particular, there was Veronica Pascual Boe, who's the CEO of Asti Mobile Robotics, and the way she described of all of the tasks that happened to be able to get goods to us it was just such an insight. Now, for me personally, and maybe you as well, you know, I've bought things online all the time and not given it a second thought of what happens. And so the fact that she could describe in detail this cascade of events that happen after I push the buy now button, it just made me, I suppose, realize of all the stuff that goes on that I was so naive to. And of course, how robots are an integral part of that. Also in that same episode, our producer Izzy Clark spoke with technology journalist and consumer champion David McClelland. And they spoke about not only the e-commerce revolution in general, but also specifically they spoke about, of course, Amazon. And something interesting about Amazon that you might not know is they've actually gone into sort of bricks and mortar stores. Okay, now they're called Amazon Fresh in the UK or Amazon Go if you're in the US. And these stores have opened up in North America and a few in the UK too. In fact, where I live in London, there are now six. I haven't actually been to them. It's been on my list, a bit like it's a sightseeing trip. So there you go. There's a little window into the type of person that I am. Now, to give you the details of how this is all possible, here is Izzy and David with the details. Examples of how innovation is being used to make more efficient the in-person shopping experience. And Amazon knows a thing or two about about how to do uh, online logistics and retail at scale. With its Amazon Go stores, or Amazon Fresh as they're called in the UK, they've been experimenting, and I think it is an experiment at, at this stage, uh, with something called frictionless shopping. These are grocery stores that look very much like any other you would see on a, on a high street, with the main exception being there is literally no checkout, no cash till. You check in as you walk in and you uh, open up your smartphone and you zap a QR code on a little barrier as you walk in. And then you go around picking up your shopping, putting it straight into your bag, and then you just walk out the first time you do it, it feels worryingly like shoplifting. Well, yeah, so this is what I was imagining. <laughs> You're just like, oh, yeah, there's all my groceries off I pop. Like, yeah. that, it, so how does that work? How can that how can you just take all of these stuff off the shelves and then just walk out the front door? Well, again, it's this magical mix of hardware and software that makes this work. And, and what's what's really happening is uh, computer vision systems and artificial intelligence are tracking where you are in the store and what you're picking up and even what you put back. So it, it'll be able to track if you pick up that packet of Smarties and put them in your bag and then have second thoughts about them and put them back on the shelf again. Uh, it's all tracked with remarkable 
accuracy. So once you once you leave again, you just get a bill by email and you get charged uh, accordingly. And of course, you have the opportunity to uh, contest any items that may not have been picked up properly. So this whole checkout process has been automated digitally to make in-person shopping more efficient. But the actual shopping experience itself is is remarkably similar. You know, it's just like any other convenience store on your high street, except for when you walk out without paying. So where are we seeing those? And do you think those are going to be more and more popular in the next few years? These stores are an experiment, I think I would call them, to be honest, because I don't know really how many consumers have been crying out for uh, uh, an experience where there's a, a slightly shorter uh, checkout experience. Sure, queuing up at supermarkets can be a bit of a pain, but I don't really know if that's a reason for Amazon to suddenly break out into a new high street shopping uh, wing of, of its operations. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if this was an experiment to see. You know, Amazon's not short of a bob or two to experiment in in certain new ventures. So it wouldn't surprise me if this was an opportunity for Amazon to see if this is an operation that scales, if, if people do still want to do uh, bricks and mortar shopping, but whether the reduction in friction of the checkout till is going to cause people to go to an Amazon store rather than a traditional supermarket that might be larger and have more range, I don't think anyone knows yet. Amazon, great that it's uh, it's making an investment to see whether it is something that works because we don't always know the answers. That's That's the thing. We don't always know the questions that are being asked. We just think, well, this is an interesting idea and it takes a, a company with the scale of Amazon to test the hypothesis to see if there is something there that people will benefit from. I am such a fan of companies trying something new because, yes, it might not always work at first, but actually these, these new things start to become second nature to us without us realising and over time can add up to make a difference to our lives. I suppose a, a small example of this is I pay with my watch or my phone and it means I don't have to carry my cash card around with me, which, you know, being a female means I don't need a bag because um, I don't have pockets. So there's lots of little things. And if and if that is just so small and I suppose insignificant in itself, but they can add up to lots of small changes that make my life easier. And I'm just one person. So imagine when it becomes a nation, becomes a continent, becomes a world, all the little changes can add up to make a huge difference and make the world more efficient, which is what we need, basically. And so this is why I am a fan of companies pushing the envelope when it comes to using technology. But one thing that I have really been surprised with, I suppose, is those online giants thinking about a physical presence and, you know, utilising that bricks and mortar shop to try and stay ahead of the game. And I suppose that's because shops are no longer just where you go to buy something. They've become experiences. And of course, Amazon, as you have probably guessed, has its finger on the pulse when it comes to this trend. And in fact, when I spoke to Mark Segura at ABB, he was really excited about this very subject. Yes, it is experience, it is a showroom, it is a consultative sales, and also it's, I mean, other activities around, around the shopping itself. I mean, some others are, I mean, you know, opening cafe corners, others are putting even some small gyms, I mean, all kind of things, but everything is around the reason why you go there, really relevant. And of course, in the end, the purpose is to buy something, but you can buy online and be sent at home. That's the least important thing now for them. So retailers are transforming because all of them, anyhow, are becoming omnichannel, so they still also have a web page, but they need to leverage uh, on what they have different. And you can see also companies like Amazon acquiring sup physical supermarkets because they know that the physical store will have a future, has a future, and probably a better future and more fun future. Because basically, when you have competition, you need to become smarter. And this is what is happening now in the retail space. <laughs> 
I've been wanting to go to one of these Amazon stores where you can just walk in and walk out and it just deducts it from your account. I've been trying to find them because there is a few in London at the moment. Yeah, yeah. One of the things why robots are also used is their connection with artificial intelligence. This is really important for retailers because what they have is formally or informally a lot of information from customer needs and customer purchasing behaviors. For example, one of the ideas we have with a grocery a retailer that wants to add more value to their customers is, hey, I mean, I know that this family is buying not very healthy food. I could make a recommendation to uh, eat more healthy and I could give them even the recipes and I could have the robots preparing, preparing the orders for them. So this, this is kind of an advanced service that you would merge, I mean, AI with data, with robotics. So you will go to supermarket, you would be proposed and even, I mean, delivered a healthy menu for the week. Exactly, because we're, we're human beings. We've got lives to lead. We don't, why are we wasting our time? thinking about what we're going to be having for dinner that night like exactly just get a robot to do it yep yeah and uh, and then using uh, the, the data that you provide is using your your personal needs uh, because again using data using automation it also enhances the possibility to have mass customized things we want our menu we want our makeup we want all wherever and i explain you a couple of examples how data ai and robotics all together make that available make that available so everyone gets what they want we can also as we spoke uh, in in the previous podcast when you look at the uh, sustainability and efficiency of all these because we want things that are highly demanding if you don't do it the right way it can generate tremendous waste uh, uh, across uh, but if we do it smart then we can achieve both making it sustainable from from a, an environmental and 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 a business standpoint and also satisfy the consumer needs <laughs> So now we're going to look right back at episode two, where we examined one of the world's biggest industries, the construction industry. And we discovered how robots are leading the way in making it safer, cheaper and more sustainable. I absolutely loved talking to Ulf Hackerson. He works at Skanska Sweden. And we spoke about how robots are being used to build on sites and build these rebar cages. I mean, I examined him in lots of detail about this. But what I also liked is when he went in to talk about how they're being used in lots of different ways in terms of working at height or the fact that they can tile the floors and the walls and are used for tunneling all of these dangerous construction jobs that perhaps humans shouldn't be doing in the first place and also in that episode we heard from Shah J. Bouchan who works at Zaha Hadid Architects discussing how they use robots so they can build sustainably our producer Jack Claraman also spoke with Niels Fisher who is a director at Zaha Hadid Architects and they spoke about how sustainable construction starts with sustainable architecture here's what Niels had to say Everything that we create measures its justification by how meaningful it is. And I think one of the key aspects to sustainable architecture, and this is probably not what it is commonly associated with nowadays, is that we design buildings that can sustain their usefulness and their benefit for surrounding and, and their users. So in, in my view, the most important thing is that a building can survive um, changing preferences can survive changing use cases and can stay relevant for a very long time. And, and they're very ex interesting examples of structures like, for example, old warehouses that have been built in, in London 100, 150 years ago that are still buildings that now have their third life. They were a warehouse and potentially they were converted to an office. Now they, they serve as residential buildings. And it's almost impossible to exceed such a use of the primary energy that has been invested in creating these buildings and that has been kind of meaningfully used through, through a very long time span. So I think one of the key aspects in our work is to make buildings as relevant as possible and as meaningful as possible over the long term. And then, of course, once you have decided on, on what the brief is and, and how the building should look like and, and how it can contribute by being a meaningful platform for activities, I think then the next layer is looking into how you build it and how you can get to this design with the most efficient means. And then very importantly in buildings, also make sure that through the lifespan of a building, you make sure that its energy consumption remains 
reasonable because you will see that that in construction a lot of the carbon footprint that that buildings generate is in their operation so also not only looking into 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 material and assembly but also into the um, engineering of the building envelope and its performance throughout its lifespan is, is a very important factor in making buildings sustainable but again if the building loses its meaning the, the most energy efficient building is is a waste of energy because you will have to replace it. So in my view, the, the best building is the building that you do not need to demolish. Now, to me, that, that does make sense. A building can be built in the most sustainable way possible. But if it doesn't have a long lifespan, then there must be consideration of the energy used to build the structure that replaces it. However, this is where robots can help. Jack, our producer, he also spoke with Daniela Mittenberger. Now, she's an architect who was part of a project called Magic Queen. And what this project involved was 90 tonnes of soil. And it was all put in this exhibition space. And over a three-month period, a biodegradable structure was printed, right, out of this soil. And it made this sort of housing and inside this housing there'd be different species of plants and mushrooms over the course of the event and the 3d printed structure was all printed by this robotic gardener but not only that it also used sensors and responsive technologies and machine learning to create a continuous feedback in which it would sense what was going on, monitor this change, and then induce the necessary alterations to the structure. And all of this was seen by this robotic gardener. If you're intrigued as to what this looked like, there's a video on ABB's YouTube channel and on this subject of sustainable architecture. When Jack spoke to Daniela, she had a little bit of a different opinion to Niels, arguing that actually by using different materials than the ones that we standardly think of, so materials such as soil, our architecture can be sustainable as well as adaptable. Here's Daniela. The idea is that something that seems so natural to us, like soil, as a building material, something that we can use to create completely novel forms. And in this moment of creating something very uh, novel in appearance, at the same time, something that's very familiar to us, like soil, allows to create these novel situations. So people that encounter the Magic Queen are startled because they feel like something is familiar, but at the same time, they never saw it in this kind of constellation. This is something we really were aiming and striving for, because in this moment, you uh, start to surprise people with architecture not with gimmicks, but actually by transforming something that they see every day. And very often we got the question, if this is really soil or is this something, a specific kind of soil that can do this? And it's actually normal soil. And through the binder that we developed in the office, we actually managed to create some complex 3D forms that we are normally not used to see in combination with soil. It's very important that at the same time, it's a living material. That means now we start to see it growing. So we have grass growing on it currently, which really underlines the importance of incorporating uh, biodegradable materials, which have the capability to work as a substrate for other, other living systems. So the Magic Queen is for us a prototypical architecture, which discusses a lot of points um, that normally are not discussed with the normal construction industry. The first one is definitely to create an architecture that is not constructed to exist forever, which means an architecture that is uh, allowed to decay, an architecture that has a lifespan. The question, do we need to build, do we need to create a building that lasts for 100 years? Or do we just need to create buildings that last for a specific period or needs to be adaptable enough to grow or decay according to your needs? Um, That's one of the really important things that um, we also would like to discuss in the the Magic Queen, time and architecture. Also this idea of our relation to architecture, because of course it's soil is a a substrate, it's a living material, it can, other biological systems can grow on it. So it's not just built for us, it's built to have a closer connection between us and the environment. That means when we touch it, it's a tacit feeling that we are normally not used to. 
because we feel that there's something growing inside of it. There's changes that are happening over a specific period. So it's not a shield or a capsule, but actually more a permeable border between us and the outside. I'd like to know how soil and robots could be further utilized in architecture and construction, but I'd like to know also about how robots could adapt across other sustainable materials too. I think a lot is in the process of developing projects, projects that are um, seen as prototypes to test these materials. For instance, with the soil, we very much understand it as a building material and we see it very much as the next step would be a building directly with robots on site using, using the soil and at the same time using complex three-dimensional shapes. If we look at the form and the shapes of the Magic Queen, it is definitely nothing that we could have done without the tools available. It means computational logic or robotic fabrication. That means the um, same thing as we did in the Biennale was we just brought the robots. The soil is coming directly from there. And this, I think, also shows this advantage of saying we need a tool the tool is the robot. All the building materials we find directly on site, which means we didn't need to transport anything. And also um, for, the, for instance, the Magic Queen, um, the building material stays there. This means we produced an installation with almost zero waste. And this is something that shows all the potential that we can have with biomaterials and robots, because we can stay and have all the advantages of digital fabrication and at the same time um, produce sustainable architecture. Daniela there, reminding us again of a future where with robots we can build homes as quickly as they can be taken down. And how brilliant would that be to have a robot that could just add an extra room when you need it and it be done in a sustainable manner? Because imagine if you're lucky enough to have a garden and in the summer obviously you want to enjoy the sunshine, but as autumn would draw in... You could just extend your house, build an extra room for the holiday period so people can stay when you won't be using the garden. Pretty good, right? Now it's time for us to look back at one episode that that became one of my favourites, and that is episode four on digital twins. A digital twin being a virtual representation of like a real life scenario I suppose is the way to say it and what I loved about this episode was just how much more you could get from these digital twins than you can from a paper plan or a traditional sort of 3D plan that they're just so much more than that and and when I chatted to Leonardo of Volvo how he was describing how you can use these on the factory floor and virtually on the factory floor and how it can just save you so much time. And what I loved is in terms of those mistakes, those all important mistakes when learning just became less critical. And to me, the more mistakes you can make, the more learning that can happen. And the way that digital twins can feed into that was just something that I hadn't thought of before. And the fact that digital twins are so precise was, I just, I'm a huge fan of digital twins. And that also led on to an incredible conversation with Gregor Kuhn, who's the head of strategy and portfolio development in ABB's robotics and discrete automation division. And we chatted about how ABB use these digital twins across the world. And we also spoke about what the future of digital twins might look like. And Gregor really started to blow my mind when he got onto the subject of merging digital twins with machine learning. A further step what you could do with a digital twin, if you combine a digital twin with, with artificial intelligence, try on the digital twin, optimize on the digital twin, and then you don't need even, you know, you can have autonomous optimization, autonomous programming. Yeah, you know, for instance, in robots nowadays, wow. they can already learn to pick random objects in a warehouse, a thing that you could not program. Yeah. But you need, you know, if you combine all these new technologies together, you get even more powerful. And I, I think, you know, there are definitely things that I don't know that you could do, um, that I couldn't think of that they could do, that somebody is thinking of, somebody is doing. You know, we, we are in such a fascinating dynamic environment um, that constantly they're coming new ideas up, what you could do if you use these powerful technologies and combine them 
to, to create further value. That's really fascinating. That's what I said. That's why I said at the beginning, I, I feel privileged to be in that position. It's just fascinating what's happening. Yeah, and and, and again, it's, it's such a great time for it, isn't it? Yes, it is. It definitely is. Such a, and, and did Corona sort of accelerate it a little bit yes. in terms of in the time? Oh. It definitely, it definitely did. I mean, people are, it accelerated on several fronts. As we discussed before, people needed to work remotely. They needed to work more mid bit models because they were just not allowed to meet in person and go on site. Mm -hmm. um, so more people just got exposed to it and like it and continue to do that. Um, the other thing is, of course, like automated systems are also more resilient. Yeah. Yes. That you also need to keep in mind, right? And if, you, if you're in an industry where you anyhow have a worker shortage, you know, and then you come to a mm -hmm. point where you're not even allowed to go there, so they're more resilient. So yes, it has definitely increased the, it definitely has increased the interest, the potential, and the actual deployment of, of, of flexible automation. And I think this flexible automation is for me the key thing. That's the difference. It's flexible. Yeah. And yeah, with the AI bringing in that machine learning as well, we'll just, I just want to let them loose on bus timetables. And <laughs> <laughs> think of the efficiency yes. that could happen. And I'm, and I'm sure like it's already in work on trains and things like that for what starts on the factory floor just spreads, right? Have you seen the video of the, the robot learning to pick up an object? Oh, yes. Um, yes. And how long it takes it. And I found that fascinating because... I mean, just the different, to, it's the, go on. It's, if you think about for us, you know, grabbing an object with our hand is a very normal, usual thing. But programming it in a deterministic way, it's impossible. I, you, could, you, you could try to describe somebody, how do you know you need to stop? How do you know how to grab things, et cetera? Yeah. You know? And it's machine learning that enables robots to do that. It teaches robots to grab objects they haven't seen before. Teaching a robot to grab an object that comes in a structured way that the robot has seen before, you can easily program. And just to help those that might not be ultra familiar with machine learning, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gregor, it would be a case of um, the robot not being programmed to do a thing, but basically being told if it does a thing, if that thing is right or wrong, and then it slowly keeps on trying lots and lots of different uh, iterations of... Yes move until it just gets more right than wrong and then it slowly learns how to be yes. more right <laughs> yes yes exactly i think that's, that's a good a way very of bizarre it's a good it's a good way like a good way to describing it um and here comes again the digital twin now if you have a one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one digital twin of the actual system the machine learning can actually learn on the digital twin Wow, it, is, it has been such an incredible series and I have massively enjoyed being able to speak to these experts and I hope you have enjoyed being a part of those conversations too. There are some huge thanks that need to go to David McClelland, Mark Segura, Niels Fisher, Daniela Mittenberger and Gregor Kuhn for their contributions to this episode. And also, I want to thank all of our experts from across the series. The future of robotics is massively, hugely exciting. And the Robot Podcast will be back to find out how robots at the cutting edge of innovation continue again and again to push boundaries. I'm Fran Scott, and this is the Robot Podcast, a fresh air production for ABB. Part of the ABB Decoded series.